the Strategic Hot Box with Dr. Brandy Love Stankovic. Discussing leadership, business, and how to take control of your life and achieve greatness. From the streets of Las Vegas, energized, informed, and never diluted. It's time to kick some ass. Welcome to the Strategic Hot Box. It's your girl, Dr. Brandy Stankovic, and I'm excited that you're here with me. We're going to talk about how to score like the Vegas Golden Knights. We got all sort of excitement happening here in the studio today, and we're going to welcome a very special guest with us, Dennis Bernstein. He's going to talk a little bit about community and professional sports teams and, and what it takes to really go to the top. So let's get started. As you know, at the Strategic Hot Box, we learn, we love, and we kick ass. And so today in the Learn section, we're going to talk a little bit about the how the Vegas Golden Knights have grown and, and what it means to build a community. And then in the Love section, we'll get to know Dennis and some of the things that he is working on, as well as what he recommends for leaders to be doing in regards to scoring and taking things to the next level. And then, of course, as always, I'll leave you with some top five kick ass. So how to score like the Vegas Golden Knights? I want to tell you that when I've been in Las Vegas a very long time. I consider myself a native. And I, when we first found out there was going to be a national hockey team, I think people were skeptical, including people that were here, skeptical about what would happen with a, a sport that isn't traditionally played in Las Vegas, right? So I didn't grow up playing ice hockey like many of my friends and colleagues do from, you know, North Dakota or from Minnesota or, or Michigan, the places where it's so cold that there's ice and things around all the time. And so because of that, how can we, we come around and rally, but but really, we ended up as a, as, a, as a community rallying bigger than anyone ever expected. So, you, you know, in Las Vegas, you can find anything you want. And now, of course, we have professional sports teams, but we're here with the NHL and the Vegas Golden Knights, and then coming soon, the Raiders. And uh, as you know, and we've talked about here, and it's, and it's a somber topic, and, and we're here at the, at the anniversary, is the tragedy that happened in Las Vegas on October 1st of last year. And both the Golden Golden Knights, as well as this tragedy, really brought a sense of community in Las Vegas and camaraderie and, and people sharing and working together that we've never felt before. I don't think that the team has rallied or that the, the city has rallied around something so tremendously before. In Las Vegas, the, the number of tourists is five times the population. So think about that. There's other cities that are like that, maybe New York City and, and a few places where the population is is five times in tourists than it is in the people that are actually locals. And so often people will think of Las Vegas as the experience that they've had in Las Vegas. And most were, were expecting the Knights to, to have only uh, the visitors and the tourists be the people that were going to the games, people that were there as, as their number one fans. However, the opposite actually happened that in Las Vegas we, they, and the Knights in general, they really built a community showing commitment to Las Vegas as their home, showing commitment to the fans that they had here in Vegas. And so what lessons you know, can we learn from that? And, and I can't wait to hear from Dennis as well. But with success, I think the number one lesson when it comes to, to, to being a part of a community and being part of your own growth within a shared group is that success in community leads to social responsibility. How can we, as we progress in our own lives, give back to people that have supported us or give back to people that don't have those support networks around them? And how can we remember to engage in the community that helped build the success that we're feeling? And it's and, and when it comes to professional athletes, when it comes to people that are at the top of their game, it, that isn't just a one-time event. It's not just the one time thing that they were making it to a certain place. It's not just, well, hopefully it's not a one-time Stanley Cup, you know, visit for the Vegas Golden Knights, but it is, it's about making sure that, that it's not just one time, it's, it's, a lifetime that it's taken to get to that place and the building of those athletes and the building of the community around the people. And so when you think about your own journeys and you think about your own communities, don't forget that it's, you know, we've come a long way, baby. Right. And how is it that the people that are around us have supported us in that effort? The second is don't underestimate or stereotype a group. And the, one of the things that we learned from Vegas um, in that is that everybody didn't think that Vegas would rally around it. And now I think you have some of the greatest NHL fans there are. And I love when I see memes and things online about uh, bandwagon fans and, and all this stuff. And it's like, how can you be a bandwagon fan when we've never had a sports team? This is, we're born. They're born in Vegas. And so really, it's of course, we're rallying around a team that's here. And of course, 
I'm learning about the NHL and didn't miss a game in the fact that, and I had never been exposed to it before, but I'm appreciating the sport so much more. And I'm thankful for the Vegas Golden Knights and giving that opportunity to me. Um, when it comes to stereotypes, though, this is also important. So I think I've shared before the organization that I work with now, CU Solutions Group, shout out to my, my homies and peers, uh, is in based in Michigan. And when I thought, and this is prior to now working with the organization for um, quite a, well, nearly a year, it, I thought, when I thought of Michigan, I thought of Detroit and I thought of Eight Mile with Eminem and I thought of, you know, like just that, just this gray, dreary place. And in reality, Michigan is legit one of the most beautiful states I've ever been to in the United States. And I've been to nearly all of them. And it is so gorgeous. I spent a lot of time this summer in Northern Michigan and the trees and the people and the weather. And it's, it, it literally, Literally is one of the most beautiful states ever. Now, mind you, I probably won't visit between December and like February, but but nonetheless, it is gorgeous. And I never knew that. I didn't give Michigan the chance. Um, and now that I am, I'm so thankful for that. Well, the same is true in Las Vegas. So many people will say, oh, Vegas. Yeah, oh, Vegas. Because the only experience they have is when they came on their buddy's bachelor party or their buddy's 50th birthday. And in reality, the locals that live here live a, a life that's a lot bigger than what's happening on the strip, right? And we th- we're thankful for all the tourists to come here and pay all our taxes but <laughs> but nonetheless it is uh it is a, a city that's that's much broader than that so it's not fair to stereotype the final thing that i want to share before we bring dennis in is that talent you know will get you to a championship or talent may get you the job but really teamwork and hard work is what wins you know it, it really takes people coming together and working together to make things happen So now our expert, Dennis Bernstein, is going to join us and share a little bit about his journey in NHL and sports journalism and how he sees the Golden Knights and how they can continue to inspire and be influential leaders, how you can, how they can, and how we can work together to do that. So let me tell you a little bit about him. Dennis Bernstein is a senior writer for The Fourth Period. He's a radio host, Sirius XM, Off the Rush. He is also the chair of the L.A. chapter of the Professional Hockey Writers Association. He's got his bachelor's from Ryder University and MBA. MBA in finance from Fordham, and he also daylights. If he didn't have enough going on, he daylights as an award-winning recruiter. So I'd like to introduce you now to Dennis Bernstein. Hey, Dennis, how are you? Hey, Dr. B. It's great being with you. Thanks for having me on the Strategic Hot Box today. <laughs> All right. I'm excited that you're here. So first, most important question, who's your favorite NHL team? I, I can't root for teams, Brandy. Come on. I'm a, re- <laughs> I'm a reporter. Look, d- Look, I will say this, though. 15 years ago, I was on the air in Vegas on the radio saying that if you get a hockey team to Vegas, it's going to be a success. So I was rooting for the franchise to be a success. It's been even ex- exceeded my expectations. So do I want the Vegas Knights to do well? Yeah. Is it good for the league? Of course it is. Um, do I root for them to sit in the press box and clap when they score a goal? No. And they're actually here in Los Angeles tonight as a uh, playing a preseason game. But I- I'm so happy for the success for the organization, for the city, and for the league. Yeah, absolutely. So tell us about your journey and and, and how you've come to be. Sure. I, I think it's just about a couple of things. It's about leadership. It's about integrity. It's about building relationships. But I think if you have no relationships, Brandy, you're nowhere. Uh, if you don't have integrity of your word, you're nowhere. So when I was trained to become a recruiter and, and also a sports reporter, the one thing that I was trained about was um, being of your word. And, and ha- being transparent. And we hear all these bud words today about transparency. Um, I'm all about that. I've been like that for years. I think that's why I'm successful because when I say something, you can count on it, number one. Number two, uh, my relationships are so robust and because they've been cultivated over time, if I don't know the person that can help you, I probably know the person that can help you. So I mm-hmm. open up my network to people um, all the time because uh, a lot of people do reach out for me for career advice or to get them a job or help them career wise. Most of the time I can't help them, but I'm transparent and saying I can't help you. Mm-hmm. But you talk to Jane or Joan or Brandy and they'll be able to help you. They're good people. And since I have great integrity in my relationships, people will pick up the phone and say, oh, yeah, Dennis. Yeah, he's from New York. He talks fast. He's got that silly accent, but he's a good guy. And and that's what I want to do, I think, in life. I've been down here, to, I think, uh, on this planet to help people with their careers. Mm. I want to just help. And I just I I get a kick out of seeing people um, progress in their careers, help them and and see success stories. And I think that that's what makes me tick. The good thing about daylighting as an award winning recruiter, as you put it, (laughs) the one thing that I'm always doing, Brandy, day in, day out is asking people why. 
Mm-hmm. Why did the power play stink last night? Why do you want this job? So I'm always trying to get to the essence and reality of, of a person. So I'm part-time, psych, part-time psychologist, part-time recruiter, part-time reporter. And just my career, it just fits so nicely because I'm always interviewing somebody, mm-hmm. either on the ice, after, off the ice, or in an office, or on the phone. I'm always talking. I love to talk, and I just love to help people. So, um, And I think that... Uh, being now the, the head of the Hockey Rise Association in Los Angeles, I, I think that proves the type of person that I am, the integrity that I have, that I bring to the to the table, no matter what table it is, whether it's the interview table, whether it's the locker room facility, whether it's sitting down with a general manager like uh, a George McPhee or Rob Blake here in Los Angeles. I just think that um, I'm a really good guy, and I've been kept, I keep my word to people. I think especially when you can't help somebody. Mm-hmm. Uh, at some point in time, just giving them encouragement, saying, hey, you can do this. And Brandy, if you look at my credentials, like I shouldn't be some big shot radio analyst or reporter because um, I, with respect to my writing, I got a C in English in college. <laughs> I took I never took a creative writing or journalism course in my life. Yet I know how to tell a story. I know how to write well for business. So by rights, I shouldn't be here. So I'm grateful for all the achievements and hockey's taken me around the world. I was in Stockholm last year. We're going to go to Helsinki in November for the uh, two NHL games in in um in in finland this year so i i think that my travel around the world and just how i go about my things i think also about positivity i'm just mm-hmm. a very positive person i i'm definitely a glass half full person and i just like to help people so i think that's where i've gotten my journey and and i think that sometimes age has is a factor that helps people sometimes mm-hmm. we don't want to look at the older cat as a, a guy that can help but uh, with respect to me, I've been around the block. I never panic. I always know how to be analytic, mm-hmm. but also be tactical, right? Because mm-hmm. I can move. I know how to close deals. But I understand big picture and what it takes to be a success with respect to um, the big picture. So I understand that I might not help this person today, but they may need my help in six months. And I might need their help in six months. So right. I never say no to a connection on LinkedIn or having an opportunity to have a conversation about either business or hockey. So what, what responsibility then do professional sports teams have to their fans, their community? Well, I, you brought up the nights in October 1 of last year. And, and I think that, and I was there for opening night the first night. And I think that there was a, the responsibility to this community was dialed up in Las Vegas even more so because of those tragic events. And mm-hmm. they treated that night, opening night, with such respect for the, the ones who lost their lives. And they just handled it so wonderfully. Mm-hmm. And so I think there was an extra level of responsibility that night. I had tears in my eyes, Brandy. I mm-hmm. was in the, I was in T-Mobile that night. And if you didn't have tears in your eyes on the way this, this all went, was executed, then, you know, you're, you're not a human being. You don't have a heart. So I think overall the responsibility is, yes, a sense of community and connect. Here in Los Angeles, I'll give a great example. Um, we have the Toyota Sports Center. Mm-hmm. Um, and they make a ton of money with respect to um, bringing in um, uh, Youth hockey. I think in any NHL city, if you don't have a robust youth hockey program, then you're doing the the community a disservice. Yeah, it's about selling tickets and promoting products for your advertisers. But I think that that the takeaway from any any NHL city is build your youth community. If you go into Mm -hmm. the Toyota Sports Center any day, there are four sheets of ice. It's packed. There's kids running around. There's hockey lessons. There's skating lessons. And and I think that's where you build it. And that's why I love this sport so much, Brandy, is because it is about team it is about there's 23 players on an NHL team it's you may have a great player like a Conor McDavid but if he doesn't have 22 other individuals supporting his effort they'll never succeed so the most times the most talented team like Washington did last year they weren't the most talented team last year but it's the sense of teamwork it's the sense of helping each other Mm -hmm. I think that's instilled in a very young uh, age with respect to hockey and, and that team concept. And that's all I see. It's that, you know, the players, I love the players in the sport. They're not the most outgoing kids in the world mm-hmm. because they've been trained to be part of a team. You know, mm-hmm. a lot of these guys come from humble beginnings. Their first agent might be their mom or their dad. Um, right. So they don't have any sense of entitlement that maybe an NFL or an NBA player have who will push through, you know, high school and college and don't even have to go to class sometimes. With hockey, you're riding a bus in junior hockey for 14 hours a day. So that when you get to the point where you're here in Los Angeles playing for the Kings and you stay at the Ritz-Carlton and they're carrying your equipment, these kids, they're so grateful for this that they willing, they're willing to give back to the community. So I think there's a large responsibility to the community for NHL franchises. And I, I know they do it right in, in Vegas now. They have a beautiful practice facility where you see kids going in and out. But I think you, with respect to hockey, you get kids when they're young and it stays with them for life. And the same is true when it applies to any kind of business or leader or sport, being able to, to nurture the talent that's coming behind them, to be humble in, in progression. What else can people learn from and, and incorporate? 
operate in their communities for success. I, I- well, I just think that um, with respect to how they do that, with respect to talent, it's it's nurturing, it's progressing. It's like you want to to bring on people on your team that are better than you, that will acquiesce. To, you know, you want a succession plan in your business, right? You want to get the best people possible that will fit culturally because, you know, I, I do some work with Red Bull, um, but the, a person that works at Red Bull may not be a fit at Disney or a more corporate uh, a, a culture. So it's, it's about culture. It's about fitting in. But I think it's about finding and nurturing talent and and promoting them mm-hmm. and uh, hoping them to go on. So that's what you want. You want something from your life where you'll be able to go on and progress. So you want to be a great manager. And that's what great managers do. That they, they finesse talent, they promote it and they nurture it so it grows. And you can't do you can't do everything by yourself, Brendan. I've learned that the greatest most talented executives in the world, they need a great leadership team around them. And more and more you hear about leadership and and how do you exa- uh, yeah, how do you uh, uh how do you embellish leadership? You found great people and you put them in situations where you Give them the resources to succeed. Mm-hmm. So I think that that's a lot of it is finding the, the talent that will fit for your organization and then nurturing it and promoting it. And and it's about them. You know, when I have a team around me and they have successes, it's all a team success, but I don't promote my own success. Maybe my greatest gift is a recognizing that talent, but the execution of the talent, give credit where credit's due to the people, the talented people around you. Um, that'll help you succeed. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I think that you've spoken to it, that that there's things that we can learn from the NHL. There's things that we can learn from the way that they build community and the way they build that next kind of leader, that next little kid that aspires to be them. That's a little different than what we might see in other professional sports. Oh, yeah. Look, in basketball, they know you're a great player in eighth grade. Mm -hmm. So you probably don't go to class in high school. You probably don't go to class in college. And then if you're from the inner city, we hand you $40 million on your first contract, right? <laughs> so how's that person supposed to react? They're going to go out and buy four cars mm-hmm. and a Bugatti and a Rolls Royce. And with respect to that, so it, it, it's careful that, you know, you want people to earn their keep. And I think that's the one thing about NHL players, because of the process they go through, that it's not glamorous, mm-hmm. that even if you are recognized as a great player, you still have to ride the buses in juniors. You still have to go to the minor leagues most of the time. You still have to get, you know, indoctrinated by the, uh, by the veteran leadership on the team. I think the process in, in, in going through becoming an NHL star is much more humbling and much more uh, um, it, it, there's much more work involved, right? It, it, you live the a basketball or football player leaves a charmed life. I really think so. I think in hockey, it just uh, and I think also it's social from a social standpoint, I, I see when kids grow up, they it's usually a two parent family with respect to hockey because let's be real here. Uh, it's it's expensive to have equipment, expensive sure. to have skates and sticks. It's five five hundred a thousand bucks to gear up a, a player, and then mm-hmm. you have to find the ice time at six o'clock in the morning here in Los Angeles. It's not a lot of ice, so right. you need you need that that family unit to be a success more so than maybe in basketball. You need a rim and a ball, and football, uh, you know, sometimes you need a little bit more. But I think you have to be better equipped from a a social standpoint to be a hockey uh, to be success in hockey, and that's part of it. So I think that the kids that come into the league that get and you know, look, they don't make great. Well, I shouldn't say great money. They get eight hundred thousand dollars a year. You know, eighteen or nineteen years old. But you know, they don't get. They're they're just. They understand that you have to work for it. And they, I think mm-hmm. they're raised better with respect to their parents as two parent families. They understand the principles that son, you know, you're gifted, but you have to come in and work. So I think that's the one thing about hockey players, Randy, is that you you may have the gift, but you have to come in and work with your gift and earn it. And I think that's what I see with players that finally get to the NHL because it's a very, very small percentage like any other professional sport. Sure, that actually uh, makes it. Mm-hmm. And what is the age that, what's an age of a player, an average range of player? What's, what is it, 18 to 35? Yeah, I would say that the average hockey player's career is probably mm, three to four years. So if you get to the 100-game plateau, you're good. Yeah, so a lot of kids don't make it because there's always a younger, faster player trying to take your spot every season. So, so, But but legitimate star players like an Andre Kopitar here in Los Angeles, like Andre came here when he was 19 years old from Slovenia, from the Swedish League, and now he's 32, 33. Two years ago, he signed an 80 million eight-year contract, so he's set for life. He's going Mm -hmm. back to Slovenia after he plays. So so the, the sweet spot for players would be probably 18 to 30. Once you get north of 30, because this game has evolved so much in the last th- two or three years, and the Vegas Golden Knights have a lot to do with it because of mm-hmm. their speed and skill that they play with, um, that's when you're getting not over the hill, Brandy, but now there's questions about age, about your skating, because you mm-hmm. always have to skate in this league more and more. So you have a tendency to slow down. Your age and your bones get a little bit older. And they get beat They're- up. 
they get beat up, right? The, the physical cost of 10 or 12 years in the league mm -hmm. um, also uh, takes its toll. But the, the exceptional players can probably play to the mid-30s, and then they're probably looking at retirement. So any it's from 18 to 30, anyway. 35. Yeah, it, it's, you know what? All these players have to look at, at, at the future, right? Mm -hmm. It's a great nest egg. It's a great start for their careers. The wise ones understand that this is a great opportunity they got to, to, to start the rest of their life because mm -hmm. at 35, when they step away from the stage, Brandy, that's now part what? of the issue. Mm -hmm. They're not the famous hockey player anymore. Some mm -hmm. are okay with that. Others aren't. And so they have to adjust to life beyond hockey. And that's true. And anybody that's seen a, a fall of fame or some sort of leadership success and having to think, always think about what's next. So what's your thoughts on the Golden Knights for the season? Okay, well, do I think they're going back to the Stanley Cup final? I'm not sure, but I will say this. George McPhee has done a mar marvelous job restocking the, the cupboard. He lost a couple of key players last year. He lost David Perron and James Neal to free agency, but he brought in uh, Paul Stasny, who's a great center, and then just made a great trade for a guy who's a personal favorite. I'm on the air a lot in Montreal, and getting Max Patch ready for the Montreal Canadiens was a great move, and they did it upright. They had him in his videos already. They flew him around in a helicopter in the city. Max already loves the city. He's acclimated towards it, and he's only been here a couple of days, so they're going to be a very dangerous team. The one mm -hmm. thing about the Vegas Golden nights this year, Brandy, though. Last year, they had the uh, the element of surprise with them. The mm -hmm. first 20 games of the season, there was no video on the Vegas Golden Knights. Right. Nobody knew how they were right? mm -hmm. So with all the success that you talk about and all the great things that happened last year with this team, well, from game one, guess what? When they go into a building now, that's a big game for the for the home team. Mm -hmm. Before, it was just some some expansion team. Who's the Vegas Golden Knights? that make fun of the uniforms or whatever. But now with <laughs> all the stuff with the Stanley Cup final, with, you know, but I'll say what's one thing about the Golden Knights. They've done everything right. When the pregame show is part of the telecast now in, in hockey, which that never happened before, but because the way it's staged in Vegas, how that is, they've done such wonderful things for hockey. They've kind of understood that this is about entertainment. Yeah, yeah you got to win games. you got to have great players. But this extends way past that. And the team's done that. So I suspect they'll be in the run for the divisional crown. I think, um, are they going to be the most talented team? No. They weren't last year, though, when they got to the Stanley Cup final. Right. So I think this year they're going to be in it. They're going to be 100 points a uh, game. I love the coach. Turk is a great coach. G Gerard Gallant, they still have the uh, the core of the team still with them and getting Max Patcher and Paul Stasny. They're going to be in the mix. The one thing that I concern myself with is, you know, they, they lack the element of surprise. Yeah. Exactly. So that's the one thing. But I think they'll be a very dangerous team again this season. And, you know, you brought up a really good point about fan engagement. I know when I went to the games, they did such a good job of fan engagement, of making everybody feel like they were part of the game, um, more so than I've even seen when I've seen the Lakers play or when I've seen different, like, huge franchises that have been around forever in different sports. And so I really, I really enjoyed that. They have done a good job. So do you have any hookups for tickets? Do I have any hookups for tickets? <laughs> yeah, well, I get it for free. So I get hookups for tickets. Oh, well, <laughs> that you can share with your new best friend on the strategic hot yes, box. <laughs> I, I think we can because, you know, the, the players get tickets for games and they don't always use them yeah, every night. So See, yeah, it does get, pay to know people. You were right. Uh, you were <laughs> <laughs> we're getting all these these things in our ears for those of you on live that everybody's talking about what about me what about me um so share a bold action or takeaway for uh for our listeners today or people that are watching okay always take the phone call no matter who it is take the phone call look to help you give more than you get that's what i always say because you it'll come back to you it may not come back to you this week or this month or this year, Brandy, but it will come back to you. That's how I've been su successful because people have come to me and I've had no stake in the game. I've had no reason to help people. I pick up the phone, I listen, and I try to guide them uh, on a path that they're looking for to assist them. That's one of my gifts in life, I think, is that I do that. So I always say don't decline the call. Even if you think it's inconsequential or it may be a waste of your time, make time to have that one conversation with somebody at least once a day or once a week maybe or whenever the case may come. But don't think that it's an inconsequential call because I've taken Taking those inconsequential calls, and they've turned out to be just a, a, a you know just a, a fantastic mm -hmm. connection and 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 just doing that. So that's what I say: have those conversations. Don't be afraid to have a conversation, and don't be afraid to put yourself out there. You know, mm -hmm. I'm a very very outgoing, flamboyant person at times. I'm on Twitter, I'm on social media, engage in social media. A lot of social media is bad, but. You know, mm -hmm. I'll tell you this on Facebook, I've connected with people from family members I hadn't known 20, 25 years. So mm -hmm. be engaged on social media, um, learn from it. Don't take it like everything else. Don't take it for, for at, its, at its face value, but just be engaged, be in the fight, be, mm -hmm. uh, be anticipatory. I mean, just, just participate in life. It's it. There's so much greatness around because, you know, Brandy, 
these days you can look at all the negative stuff in the world. And I'll be frank with you. I can't watch the, the, the local news anymore. It depresses me. Mm -hmm. But I, I go and I find the goodness in people and the goodness in life. And how you do that is the old school, not by texting, but by having conversations with people. I think the lost art that we have in this country and in this world, in fact, is, is conversation. Mm -hmm. Have conversations with people. Don't answer people by email. Pick up the phone and call them. Now, I'm a recruiter. I paid to, I get paid to do that. So maybe I have more skin in the game than that. But it's have that extra conversation. Look yeah. to help people. And, and at this point, give more than you get because it will sure. come back to you in spades. Absolutely. So how can people, what are your Twitter and Facebook? What are, how can people get a hold of you? Okay. Uh, Dennis TFP on Twitter. I'm always active on there, especially on hockey. I'll answer your questions. I'm patient. Unlike other reporters, I have the time <laughs> to answer questions. Unless you get really belligerent, I'll answer it and have a conversation. Facebook, you just find me, Dennis um, uh, Dennis Bernstein. And LinkedIn, also Dennis Bernstein. Um, and then if you want to listen to me on SiriusXM starting October 6th, Saturday, uh, from 11 to 1 uh, p.m. Eastern on SiriusXM on Off the Rush with my co-host, uh, Nick Alberga and Dave Panyota. I'll be on there all season. So the best way to probably find me and engage with me is probably on Twitter. I know it's a blessing and a curse Twitter someday. So, but uh, <laughs> as a reporter, you really need to be active on social media to get your message out. So if you want to message me, that's the best way to find me. Love it. Can't wait to listen to your show. Thank you so much for being here with us today. And go Knights, go. Thanks, Brandy. Appreciate the time on the strategic hot box today. Let's head out to our shout out. Brandy, this is Mike Covert from Ha Long Bay, Vietnam. Good luck with the strategic hot box. Woo! <laughs> That's real good. That's <laughs> I love the energy in that shout out. Thank you, Mike Covert, um, for giving us a shout out from Vietnam. And thank you so much to Dennis. I could, I literally, he has the perfect radio voice and I could listen to him forever and I can't wait. And I, he's got to be a wealth of knowledge when it comes to everything about the players. You could, it, That was visible just in, in, in what we were listening to today. So thank you to Dennis. So it is my favorite time, your favorite time. It's time to kick some ass. Here's your top five. Number one is to incorporate that social responsibility. He talked about it from a professional athlete athlete standpoint. We talk about it from just a leader. Once you've achieved something, don't forget to give back to the people that have helped build you to the place that you've come and know what your community is and how you can really serve. Number two is just that, serve your community. And so even if it is a social responsibility, it's just about the, the general kind of sport that you're in. So we're at the professional athletes or, or building camps for young athletes, or if you're a leader, if you can help young leaders or emerging leaders in your area, and then serve the community in which you serve and, and giving back as much as you possibly can. And don't forget that your community is not always your clients and it's not always your city. It could just be you know your people, your tribe, your family, your friends. Number three is to rethink stereotypes. We talked about it with Vegas. I talked about it with Michigan. Talked about it with the Golden Knights. Like, who are these teams? And look how they've, they've gone and, and taken over. So rethink any stereotypes that you have. Try to shake those out of, your, out of your head to give people the fair chance or to not underestimate your competitors. Number four is teamwork really is synergy. The more that you can work together, the stronger you become. You might have a, a, an amazing athlete and a single athlete, but unless the team can work together, the team won't win. And so teamwork really does build that synergy and, and becomes synergy. Number five is don't chase the puck, lead it, drive it, smash it. And that I feel like is just the message we have here at the hot box as well. You got to learn a little, you got to love a little, and then you've got to go kick some ass. There's your top five. Thank you again to Dennis for being a part of our show today and check him out on all the places that he mentioned. And hopefully you're out supporting the Vegas Knights as well or any other sports teams that you have in your areas or countries for those that are listening from, from afar. So share your thoughts with us and Twitter at Brandy Love, B-R-A-N-D-I-L-U-V and on Instagram and Facebook at Strategic Hotbox. You can always email us as well, podcast at strategichotbox.com or head out to the website and check us out and see the different things that we have there for you. We'll have all of our guest information. We've got some cool merchandise. We have some cool links, some worksheets, anything that you need to succeed. Until I see you again, get out there and kick some ass.